Welcome to The Real News. This is Mark Steiner. Good to have you all with us once again. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this. Trump's authoritarian and racist predilections were always there from his loudmouth real estate days to his insulting reality shows on TV, and they began to manifest themselves as soon as he became president. The perfect storm has arrived of a COVID pandemic, economic collapse, and the depth of racism rearing its evil and ugly head, and it converged all together to heighten the Trumpian threat against our democracy and laid bare the authoritarian underpinnings of not just Trump, but the political forces around him. There's one man who's been writing a great deal about this for the nation, for Truth Out and other places, is Sasha Abramsky. And he joins us right now. He's an author of eight books, the most recent one called Jumping at Shadows, The Triumph of Fear and the End of the American Dream. And the article he wrote in The Nation that got our attention was Where Does America Go From Here? And is about to have another article out in Truth Out uh, on militarization and the police. And welcome. Good to have you with us once again, Sasha. Always good to be on the show, Mark. Thanks. So, you know, I, it's, it, let me just start from this one quote, which says it's a lot to me about where this administration is going and how they're responding to the rebellions and resistance and demonstrations taking across the country. When he quoted Chief Walter Heatley, this arch segregationist police chief from Florida in 1967, when the shooting, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Um, and that whole sentiment I mean, it, when he speaks, when he says things, you know, people think that it's because he's a buffoon, it's an accident. To me, this is no accident. This is who he is. This is what he's pushing as a way of ma- running this country. No, ab- absolutely. And one of the things that I've been doing is I followed Trump's political career over the last five years from when he was a candidate through to when he first won the presidency through you know, the last three and a half years, is look at Trump's language. And what you see is time after time after time, his borrowing of phraseology from authoritarian leaders, from Mussolini, from Adolf Hitler, the quote this week about when the shooting, looting starts, the shooting starts. And then he sort of backpedals and says, oh, I didn't know the historical references. I didn't know who I was copying. But coincidentally, everybody he accidentally copies is an authoritarian from the far right of the political spectrum. He never accidentally stumbles into, you know, quoting Martin Luther King or accidentally stumbles into quoting the Dalai Lama or accidentally stumbles into quoting Mother Teresa. The people he accidentally quotes are people who spew violence, racial division, and hatred. And so the thing that has just, I mean, it stunned me on one level, but on another level, it's been entirely unsurprising has been that as this country faces this triple implosion, the health, the implosion around the pandemic, the implosion around the loss of jobs that then accompanied the shelter in place measures, and now the implosion around civic stability. But as these three things have overlapped, Trump has made zero effort to unify. He's made zero effort to reach out to try to calm the waters. He's made zero efforts to hold summits at the White House with people, to bring them into the political discussion, make people feel empowered, make people feel listened to. Instead, as the German foreign minister put it the other day, he has thrown oil onto the fire. But the thing is, if you throw oil onto a fire that's already raging with this intensity, you lose all ability to control that fire. And so what Trump is doing is he's trying to create such unrestrained chaos, such a fear of civic unrest and civic violence, that he can militarize his administration. And you said at the beginning, militarize the police. It's actually way beyond that. The police have been militarized for many, many, many years. That precedes Trump. That goes back to the use of surplus military equipment after 911 and the Iraq war. It goes back to the war on crime in the 1990s and 1980s. It goes back to Richard Nixon's war on drugs. We have a half century of militarization of the police, pretty much from the Vietnam War period onwards. What we're seeing now, and this is unprecedented, is the President of the United States, backed up by his Attorney General, and at least in part backed up by his Secretary of Defense, has tried to introduce U.S. military personnel and U.S. military equipment, helicopters, even apparently Trump asked if he could use tanks, onto the streets first of Washington, D.C., which is where they have direct operational control over National Guard because there is no state system in place in D.C. But what Trump has asked for, essentially, is the right to militarize a response from coast to coast. What he wants to do, and he said it very clearly, is use the military in a show of domination to rein in protesters. And he's describing it as, well, I only want to rein in the looters. I don't want to rein in the good guys, the peaceful protesters. 
If you look at what he did in DC the other day, in pursuit of a photo op outside a church, they personally, Trump and William Barr, personally ordered heavily armed US military personnel to violently clear a crowd of nonviolent protesters whose only sin was they were standing in Trump's path as he hoped to walk toward a photo opportunity outside a church. And this is why, if you look at what's happened over the last three days, this array of top military figures from General Mattis to ex-General Allen to ex-head of the um, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, they have all published public letters saying that Trump is now a threat to the constitutional order. And I don't know if you and your audience have had time to read Jim Mattis's piece in particular, but I doubt you will ever have encountered in American history an ex-cabinet minister talk about and write about the president he served in such language. Because what he did was he compared the Nazi tactics of divide and conquer in the 1930s and 40s to Trump's tactics of divide and conquer today was a threat to the constitutional order. He said, we've had three years without mature leadership, and this is what we get to. And he basically said that Trump's orders to the military are illegal, and for those who uphold the oath of the Constitution, they cannot be obeyed. That is a simply extraordinary public letter from the ex-Secretary of Defense to issue to the American people. It is a warning that unless we stop this madness now, we will slide into dictatorship. So th let me pick up on that point here. It's interesting to me. I mean, I was thinking about this tweet that Tom Chirac from the nation, the Washington correspondent, put out. It said, the numbers of U.S. military security forces in D.C. right now is just ridiculous. This is pure intimidation. Trump is capitalized, very afraid. The longer we stay in the streets, the more frightened he gets. So picking up on that point and what you just said, well, there's one aspect here that's really interesting to me. And I'm very curious to, as to your analysis. So Jim Mattis and the others who are former generals in the United States Armed Forces, military leaders, are not exactly, they're not neoliberals. <laughs> they're not on the left. They're not liberals. They're not a part of the spectrum beyond the left side of the political spectrum. What does it mean to you when, with this seeming contradiction here, when you have these forces around Trump that I refer to as these kind of white racist mobs, like the ones who took over the, the capitals in, in a couple of states armed, and the, the, the neoconservative elite who's getting their way through Trump to re, 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 change the entire nation, environmental laws, laws around voting rights and more. And then you have the generals who clearly are conservative, many of them on the right, saying enough is enough. So there's a lot of, there are not, there are a lot of contradictions that go around here. I mean, what, yes, how do you put happened. that together? The, the contradictions have reached their breaking point. So you, you had a sort of uneasy alliance of convenience holding Trump's presidency together. So you had the white nationalists who you know, have some institutional power, I guess, within some of the uniformed forces in particular. But by and large, they're on the outside. They're the militias. They're the, um, they're the um, people who take to their weapons and you know, intimidate Gretchen Whitmer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you have the economic neoliberals who want nothing more than deregulation and tax cuts. Um, and you know, that's probably more where Mitch McConnell stands. Um, and then you have the people who care sort of all about the courts. It's about abortion. It's about getting conservative justices in. Trump's been able to you know, hold that circus ring together in some ways. And what's happening now is the tensions are so overwhelming. The sheer level of economic misery that's been sort of suddenly thrust on the country is so vast and you know, has no end point in sight that when you have 43 million people unemployed, you're essentially looking at a situation where one in three in the American public are now, you know, if, if, if you think they're 43 million unemployed, that's probably 100 million people all told. You're looking at a level of economic destitution worse even than the height of the Great Depression. So you have all the makings of a sort of societal crisis. You then add in the conflagration that's emerged over race relations and over um, this, you know, just stunningly brutal video of police essentially lynching a black man in Minneapolis. And you throw all that into the mix and you know, even with the most skilled rhetoric coming from the White House, you'd have an almost uncontrollable crisis. When you add into that, that Trump has no desire to control the crisis, but every desire to make it worse so that he can then impose a sort of authoritarian answer and try and sort of recreate Nixon's silent majority. That's when people start getting really scared. And so, you know, someone like Mattis, you're absolutely right. He isn't some sort of, you know, political, radical, liberal, subversive, blah, blah, blah. 
He's as much a part of the establishment as any other human being in this country. And he's right at the top of that power nexus. But the fact that so many ex-generals yesterday felt compelled to say this, the fact that the active head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, Milley, felt compelled to send a memo to every head of the different branches of the armed forces yesterday saying, remember, you have all sworn an oath the constitution and the laws of this country and people have a right to rightful protest and peaceful protest. The fact that the current head of the armed forces was compelled to say that tells you where we are and what they fear is about to be unleashed by the president. The fact that all four surviving ex-presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama, at pretty much the same time, all felt compelled to come out and warn of the dangers of conflagration and warn of the necessity to listen to the voices of the disempowered. The fact that that is all happening at once tells you everything you need to know about how much people who really are on the inside, not outsiders like me and you, but people on the inside with an understanding of what is meant by the unleashing of presidential emergency powers, the fact that they are all now compelled to go public in the way they are tells you how dangerous this moment has become. So let's pick up on that point. I mean, in the, in the piece you just wrote for The Nation, um, I, I love this line. You write that the country claims to be the, the great exception has revealed itself to be something of a, of a Greek tra tragedy instead. And, um, and so when you look at this other thing, you, and then you talked about these, these um, kind of uh, uh, white racists marching down your street, Quote uh, saying going to go after the jungle bunnies, as they put it, um, and you you took, you wrote about how the the the, the breakdown of order and the, the collapse into warring gangs and, and 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 tribes and the militarized police response. So so picking up on that point and pushing it further, does your analysis say that Trump is isolated and therefore not a danger, or is he not isolated with all these kind of armed groups around the country who support him, plus parts of the armed forces, other places and police who also support him? The, the answer is Trump is in some ways extraordinarily political weak, politically weak. He's been impeached. He's sagging in the opinion polls. He's lost his core support bases. You know, he's now trailing among older voters. Um, you know, by most traditional measures, Trump is, you know, hobbled beyond repair. The thing about Trump is the weaker he gets, the more dangerous he gets. And this has been true throughout his presidency, but it's been this sort of operating principle throughout his entire life, that he is a street fighter of the worst sort. He plays dirty, not for any greater good, but he plays dirty simply for personal self-advancement. Um, it's gangster politics, it's mafia politics. Now, the thing about our moment that you know, makes that even more dangerous is the fact that all these different groups are ready for a fight. So, you know, when I was writing about the white vigilantes on my street, you know, my area is in Midtown Sacramento and there were these huge peaceful protests over the weekend. But then late at night, as the police broke up the peaceful protests, smaller groups that probably were sort of more concerned with looting stores than any political analysis, smaller groups peeled off into the Midtown area, um, breaking into and destroying shops and um, restaurants and you know, pharmacies and so on. And it was really quite hair raising. I mean, I, I, you know, I in no way, shape or form want to romanticize what was happening. It was, you know, it was really destructive. But by about midnight or one in the morning, you know, there were sirens everywhere. There were helicopters overhead. You could hear from my you know, front door, you could hear the stun grenades going off. You could hear the volleys of rubber bullets being fired. And then by about one in the morning, I was seeing two things. I was seeing groups on bicycles that looked to me like they were probably sort of riding through the residential neighborhoods looking for looting opportunities. But I also saw these young white men patrolling. And when I went out and asked one of them, you know, stuff, he started talking, as you said, about jungle bunnies or ghetto bunnies. He was using, you know, really inflammatory language. And, you know, it made me really realize, I mean, I, I knew it already, but it, you know, it, it brought it right onto my front doorstep, the sort of realization that you have these sort of colossal clashes, not, not necessarily a videological vision, that that's part of it, but colossal clashes of warring tribes almost at this point, of gangs, of um, people out looking for trouble. It sort of reminded me in a way of the football hooligans that you'd see in England when I was growing up in the 1980s and 90s, where you'd have these very organized 
groups, you know, there, there was nothing spontaneous about the, the football riots. They were organized, they were tribalistic, they were based around region, they were based around football um, affiliation. Sometimes they were based around what pub you drank in. And they sort of clashed together. It was almost social entertainment. They both come at each other and, you know, there'd be bottles thrown and knives thrown. And, um, you know, it was a Saturday evening on the town. The problem with extending that analogy to 2020 America is you're talking about 300 million people in this country and more than 300 million guns in this country. You're talking about the most heavily armed civil society on earth. And people are increasingly taking those guns with them to political protests and to rallies and to you know, their public expression. If you bring in guns and other armor into an already tense situation, there's the potential for a calamity. And when you then have the president basically egging on the rioters or egging on the fighters or egging on, you know, whatever you want to call these different groups, you have the president essentially using his bully pulpit not to calm things down, but to make things worse. And the only way you can understand that is he has to think at this point, it's his, to, his political advantage to cause as much chaos as possible and scare as many suburbanites as possible back into his camp, despite the economic collapse, despite the you know, completely inept response to the pandemic. It's his only survival mechanism. And if he has to invoke martial law to do it, if he has to invoke emergency powers to do it, if he has to bring US military tanks onto the streets, he has shown every indication he will do that. And you know, again, coming back to what I was saying, that is why this moment is not just a moment that you know, we can sort of say, oh, well, it's like this previous moment or this previous moment. It's pretty much unprecedented. The overlap of all of these simultaneous crises at the same time as Trump is doing all, of he, all that he can to stir up trouble makes it an unprecedented moment. And, you know, I, I think it is a moment when every American of good conscience has to be out on the streets to protect democracy. And I know we're in a pandemic. We have to do it with masks on. We have to do it with as much social spacing as we can. But of all the things on earth, it is worth getting, risking getting sick for, preserving American democracy and preserving American community has to be at the top of that list. I have a great deal more I could ask and continue this conversation with Sasha, but I want to conclude on that last comment you made because I think it was very powerful and very important for us to understand. As we look at the mil calling out the military, the militarization of the police, the armed, the armed nature of our society, we are facing a really dangerous moment. And I think you articulated it better than I've heard before. So thank you once again for joining us. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Sasha. Good luck to you. Good luck to all of us. Thank you. And stay safe and stay healthy. You too. We've been talking to Sasha Abramsky, writes for The Nation, Truth Out, is a noted author as well, and has joined us before and hopefully will join us again. And I'm Mark Steinle here of the Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Please stay safe and masked as much as you can. Uh, and we'll be covering this with some depth to save what we have in this country and to move it forward. So thank you so much for joining us. Again, Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Take care.